Glenn or Glenda is a difficult movie to talk about. It's a case of... Please don't meow while I'm filming. And you know I'm gonna have to let you out again. I can't have you interrupting me. Glenn or Glenda is a difficult movie to talk about. It's a case of a movie where the story behind its production is more interesting than the film itself. But more than that, this movie doesn't make any sense if you don't know the story behind its production. So for that reason, we have to discuss this film's director, the infamous Ed Wood. Due to the topic of this film, as well as Ed Wood's personal life, I feel like I need to add not so much a trigger warning, more an explanation. This movie was made in the 50s, Ed Wood died in 1978, therefore modern terms for describing gender nonconformity were not really in use. It would rightfully be offensive in most modern contexts to use words such as transvestite, but because these terms were the commonly used ones back then, it would be extremely confusing if I tried to translate what they were saying into modern terminology. Also, a lot of the science, especially the psychology, is very out of date. I'll discuss it when I get to the movie, but I know some of the things that they said could be triggering to some people, especially trans people. And one more thing, I'm a cisgender 16 year old, I feel like I'm relatively well informed about this kind of stuff, but I'm not perfect. If I get something wrong, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend, that's never my intention. Alright, let's talk about the worst director of all time. You know, I never really felt like he deserved that title. Edward Davis Wood Jr. was born on October 10, 1924 in Poughkeepsie, New York. As a young child, Wood's mother Lillian would apparently dress him up in girls' clothes because she always wanted a girl. I've heard of stuff like this happening in cartoons, but I didn't think any mother in real life would actually do this to her child. It's very strange. As a 12-year-old, Wood would receive a film camera for his birthday, which he would use to capture footage of the Hindenburg on its last voyage before it crashed, which I have to say is some incredible luck. Like many others, Wood would enlist in the U.S. Marines shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, only 17 at the time. He would recover bodies after the Battle of Tarawa, and he would later claim that he was more afraid of being injured than being killed, mainly because he thought a combat medic might discover that he was wearing women's underwear. At this time, he was living in L.A., the home of the film industry. He would direct commercials, micro-budget shorts, anything he could do, and through this he would become friends with one of his childhood idols, Bella Lugosi, who was struggling with depression and addiction at the time. Ed Wood was a self-proclaimed transvestite, which at the time basically meant someone who society saw as a man, but dressed as a woman. He would do it all the time, that's how he felt most comfortable. In fact, he almost seemed obsessed with it, being more comfortable in women's clothing than men's, especially Angora. According to one of Wood's friends, he had a hell of a fetish. Angora, oh god, he'd pick up on a girl just because she was wearing an Angora sweater. And he'd get that sweater off her, man, I don't know how he'd do it. But he had a trunk full of them. Though he was insistent that he wasn't a homosexual, a lot of people did seem to think he was. He would receive harassment on the streets being called a queer and even getting beaten up by the cops once. Apparently he liked it when people would call him Shirley. He would go into bars completely in women's clothes and call himself Shirley. He would even name female characters in his book Shirley. One of his friends at the time said it was projection. Basically that he would use Shirley as a self-insert character. Anyway, Wood would eventually go on to make his first major, and I put major in quotes here, movie, originally titled, I Changed My Sex, but eventually it was renamed to Glenn or Glenda. The movie starred Wood as the title character Glenn, and Wood's girlfriend at the time, Dolores Fuller, as Glenn's girlfriend and wife, Barbara. Bella Lugosi was also in the movie, he was reportedly only paid a thousand dollars. Edward went into this movie with a clinical mindset. He didn't want it to have any sex or nudity in it. He wanted to make the movie to inform people about transvestism. The movie was loosely based on the well-publicized gender-affirming surgery of Christine Jorgensen in 1952, as well as Wood's own personal experiences. The movie acted as something of a loose auto-biopic for Wood, as Glenn is very clearly heavily based off himself. So finally, after all of that, we get to the actual movie. 
We start the film with an opening narration from Bela Lugosi, which is so vague it could be used in almost any movie. But to be fair, it's Bela Lugosi. I have no complaints. During which we see Lugosi's character named... Um... Wait a second. Scientist slash spirit play with beakers for about a minute. The actual plot comes into motion when an inspector is investigating the suicide of a transvestite and goes to seek advice from a doctor who I presume is a psychiatrist. This is when, only seven minutes into the movie, the most glaring issue becomes obvious. The dialogue. This is probably the worst dialogue I have ever heard. Both the doctor and the inspector talk like they are reading an encyclopedia or a college textbook. This type of case comes to me as well as yourself many times during the course of one month. The suicide? The suicide. Most of us have our idiosyncrasies. This fellow's was quite pronounced. Yes, but I wonder if it rated the death warrant it received. I don't think so. Now to be fair, some movies don't need to have amazing dialogue. But those movies don't usually have long scenes that are just conversations. The doctor, whose name is Dr. Alton, immediately breaks patient-client privilege by telling the inspector about the case of Glenn, a transvestite who hasn't told his girlfriend yet. But first, he goes over a lot of very long and very boring definitions. You see, most people in the audience back then didn't know anything about gender nonconformity or transgenderism, so it had to be explained to them, which is understandable, but it makes it hard to watch nowadays. There are many problems with the science and psychology in this movie, but it's so complicated, I'm going to save my criticisms of them for later in this review. There is an interesting segment of this movie, which is just the narrator complaining about how uncomfortable male's clothes are, a segment I'm sure was written by Wood himself, but we then get this amazing shot of a bunch of pale white Hollywood actors dressed up in Shrek masks as the narrator says, Let's go native. As we return to Glenn, he asks to borrow his sister's dress so he can wear it to a Halloween party, which I think is funny because this is still a very common thing nowadays among people who are questioning their gender. I guess some things never change. It's headlined, a man had his sex changed to a woman. Isn't that a strange case? I wonder how some people's mind works. Well, some people aren't happy the way they are. I suppose so, but to change one's sex, that's a pretty drastic step to take. If it's the only way, I'm for it. Yeah, man, I have had almost the exact same conversation before. It's sad to see how little transphobia has changed in the past 70 years. Most of this segment is the mental toil that Glenn goes through about whether, or when, he should tell his girlfriend, soon to be wife, about his alter ego, Glenda. He tries to stop wearing women's clothes, but he can't give it up and he just can't bring himself to tell her. Glenn goes to visit one of his friends, who is also a transvestite, to ask him about how and when to tell Barbara about Glenda. I guess I got a problem. Haven't we all? I mean a real problem, one like I've never had to face before. Our whole existence is one big problem after another. I want to get married. You have a problem. His friend states the obvious, tell her before you get married, and that if Glenn and his future wife love each other, then it won't be a problem. Yet Glenn still proposes to her without telling her anything. Okay, now this is when things really start to get crazy. We now follow Glenn on a 16 minute long insane dream sequence about his anxiety of telling Barbara he is a transvestite. At one point Glenn is getting married and there is a demon, Bella Lugosi is shouting incoherently, there is someone on a couch getting whipped and tied up in some sort of proto BDSM role playing or something, a girl starts undressing and dancing seductively, interspersed with shots of Bella Lugosi and Glenn looking at her. At some point a bunch of people just start appearing and pointing at Glenn, it doesn't make any sense and is totally unnecessary, it's just there to pad the runtime. Then finally, after 50 minutes of buildup, Glenn tells his wife about being a transvestite, and honestly, it might be my favorite part of the movie. Ed Wood definitely had to tell people about his transvestism in real life, and those experiences seem to have heavily inspired this scene. So it is the one part of this movie that is actually done well, and Barbara seems to accept him, 
saying she doesn't understand it, but that they can figure it out together. We now return to the discussion between the inspector and Dr. Alton. The good doctor goes on to break doctor-patient confidentiality once again by telling the inspector of another case, this time of a person named Alan or Anne. This is now when I have to unfortunately address the questionable psychology of this film. Anne is, according to Dr. Alton, a hermaphrodite, or someone born with both male and female biology. Throughout this film, transvestism, as they call it, is seen as an illness that needs to be cured, not something people should be looked down upon for having, but a problem nonetheless. And Dr. Alton presents that there are only two ways to cure this mental affliction. If they are hermaphrodites, such as Anne, they can undergo a sex change operation that will make them a quote-unquote, true girl. Or in the case of Glenn, who is not a hermaphrodite, if they undergo therapy to find the cause of their transvestism, they can stop it. This is, of course, absolute nonsense. This film proposes that all transvestites are caused by childhood trauma and that it was a symptom of a mental problem. Now, why would Ed Wood, a self-proclaimed transvestite, say such things? Well, he probably felt shame over wearing women's clothing. It's a common issue among trans people today. Imagine what it was like in the 50s. In researching this video, I read a book called Nightmare of Ecstasy. It's a collection of interviews from people who knew Ed Wood when he was alive. It's an incredible book, and it does a fantastic job of chronicling the life of Ed Wood. However, some of the things people said about Wood's transvestism were straight up disgusting. One of the interviewees refuses to even refer to him as a human being instead of referring to him as it. Dolores Fuller was Ed Wood's girlfriend at the time, and even though she played Barbara in the movie, she didn't know Wood was a transvestite. After she found out, she was not as accepting as Glenn's wife was in the movie. She broke up with him, saying, He begged me to marry him. I loved him in a way, but I couldn't handle the transvestism. I'm a very normal person. It's hard for me to deviate. I wanted a man that was all man. I didn't need those quirks. It wasn't just the Angora sweaters, but when he got into the whole bit. Which is obviously an awful thing to do. But if it wasn't for her reasoning, I would have supported her decision to break up with him. Wood was an abusive person, often being demanding towards and shouting at his partners. He was also an alcoholic, which might have contributed to the heart attack that killed him. Wood died dirt poor and relegated to obscurity until his films had a revival in 1980, when he was named the worst director of all time by the book The Golden Turkey Awards. Nowadays, he's probably most well known for his low-budget sci-fi film Plan 9 from Outer Space, and for the 1994 biopic about him starring Johnny Depp called Ed Wood. Now, after all of that, what do I actually think of this movie? It's really, really bad. Yeah, what a surprise, I didn't like it. While its message of acceptance was very progressive for the time, it's undercut by the extremely inaccurate psychology. But I can't give this film credit for much else. The writing is terrible, it often doesn't make any sense, the story is either bland or chaotic, they put too much emphasis on dialogue when all the dialogue is terrible, the acting is more wooden than George Washington's teeth, and the entire project just seems to be coasting off the popularity of Bela Lugosi's name. But after all of this, I still can't say Ed Wood is the worst director of all time. Because no matter how bad this movie was, it's clear Wood wanted to make it for its own sake. He didn't care about money, he just wanted to make his dream of making movies a reality. And that is more than I can say for most other directors. Now, while being a transvestite in the 1950s basically just meant that you were a boy who liked to wear girls' clothes, it didn't necessarily mean you were transgender, and most modern film historians agree that Ed Wood just had a fetish. Now, I won't tell you what to believe, but I'm going to leave you off with one quote from one of Ed Wood's friends, Phil Cambridge. He said, I once said to Ed, if you could have anything in life, what would you be? And he said, I'd come back as a blonde, a woman blonde. Today, I'm going to be showing you my recipe for how to make a delicious fried egg. What you're going to need, you're going to need thyme or another um, herb. Then you are going to need cheese, butter for lubrication, and an egg. Of course, we can't forget that, the most important part. Make sure you can crack it, too. You gotta make sure you can crack the egg. That's very important. Let's start with the butter. You're probably going to want about a tablespoon. Let's take the butter in the pan. Put that on low. Let that go. I actually might have used too much butter, but whatever. Um, then, the egg. Put 
Perfect. Take your spoon. The white falls out, the yolk, right there. Now, we take our cheese, we grate it. Here, that's probably enough, you don't need a lot. You're going to put your cheese into the white, that's too much cheese, it took a little bit out. Then, your thyme, just take a little bit. You cut it up. Now, if you have another type of uh, herb, it would work too and it would save you some time. Now, you're gonna have to stir it up. You have to stir up the white. Let's check on the, let's check on the pan. Okay. This butter is now lubricating, right? We take our white, take it. We pour it right on the butter. Here. Then we take our yolk, pour it gently on top of the white, right there. Now you turn it up a little bit if it's not sizzling enough. And if you really want, you can put a lid on it to make sure that it fries on the top. This is a good time for you to put all your ingredients away. You're gonna have to uh, put all this in the dishwasher, but uh, that is for future to worry about right now. Now let's check on that egg. Now it looks pretty, uh, pretty fried, in my opinion. Um, that yolk does not look super fried, but hey, you know, uh, it looks delicious. Anyway, let's. Let's move this onto a plate here. All right. There we go. Perfectly cooked egg. That's how you do it. And now this is gonna be delicious. I hate eggs.